Section 22 of, of The Desirable Alien at Home in Germany by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20, Part 1. Trier. We had been in four countries that day, I thought, with the shiver of globe-trotting pride as I turned in that night. From a bed in Paris it was that I had arisen that morning, in the course of the day we had passed through belgium looked in at the grand duchy of luxembourg and misliking it had packed into the train again and come across the frontier back into germany we could truly say that morning when we paid our bill in paris we were all unwitting that we should sleep in germany that was the fun of it our country drew us unknowingly to its bosom. Luxembourg was a fraud. Joseph Leopold had always had a weakness for Luxembourg. It is small and independent, a buffer state between two great antagonistic powers, a capital that has never been taken. For that it has to thank its impregnable position it has a coinage a set of postage stamps quite nice and suitable little laws nobody ever seems to be naughty there and nobody makes trouble nobody is looking for it and so we went to luxembourg we got out of the train about one o'clock and says joseph leopold picturesquely recounting the tale of our brief descent upon the city i gave one wild scream and desired to brush its mud from off my boots at once i did not scream i sniffed and said that luxembourg was to me like a place in a dream an ugly dream of suburbia that was all i said then and although i had been driven to mention the particular district of suburban london of which luxembourg reminds me I will not do so again, because a distinguished novelist of my acquaintance lives there and has protested. We spent in this truly blessed town two hours, and in that short space I realised what the perfect state, as designed by a radical House of Commons, and which by means of insurance bills and other forms of grand motherly legislation they are now hoping to inaugurate in good old naughty england would be like it is also the poet wordsworth's personal ideal multiplied by numbers Quote, to sit without ambition hope or aim and listen to the flapping of the flame and kettle singing its faint undersong Unquote. and one pictures the inhabitants of this dignified city socially a cut above wordsworth and the cottage at rydal sitting behind stucco marbled pilasters in gardens full of pot shrubs listening to the sudden jar of the embers in the heated stoves eating indigestible cakes and meditating their reasonable alliances their gentle business bargains their seasonable deaths or simply thinking of nothing at all this may not be so i do not state it as a fact for one moment i was in no private house of luxembourg except a mild cafe a quiet post office a respectable church but i seem to feel this sort of thing going on in the white plastered houses ensconced in gardens full of shrubs behind reticulated stuccoed balustrades like a dash road or let us say palace gardens both streets where even our nouveau has not penetrated it may not be but i think that no luxembourgeois will be capable of crime splendid crime at least history only records one crime and that is a mean one the bastard of luxembourg sold joan of arc to the english for a few hundred crowns the reason luxembourg has never been taken is its position coupled with its want of importance 
the town is situated on a vast rambling series of hills surrounded by a sort of wide natural moat approached by long bridges built over the valley from all sides two rivers flowing right through would connect it in case of a siege with the material resources of the outer world but as yet war has not menaced luxembourg the florid gardens of the citizens with their stucco bastions hang over the embattled steep and the noise of gracefully dripping fountains fills the air we bought some stamps and some postcards changed some money and got some luxembourg coins in exchange these we took as curiosities specimens of them lurk in my purse to this day wherewith i affront peaceable citizens in england france and germany and then we took the train for a town in germany treve or trier as i'm bound to call it trier is more or less a frontier town there is that feeling about it all the time one seems to hear the uncertain twittering of embarrassed peoples living on the edge of one civilization where it merges into another the want of character of the duchy is in dreary juxtaposition to the cranky national idiosyncrasies of a borderland of german people we got in about eleven o'clock at night we consumed naturally the unfailing wiener schnitzel generally a safe draw in germany at the station and then walked along into the town in search of an hotel indicated by the waiter it was very dark and dull night the sight of trier to a woman who has never seen rome and never hopes to do so i do not be it observed say hopes never to do so is something stupendous and joseph leopold who has seen rome had just come from thence in fact when we entered trier by the porta nigra was very nearly as deeply impressed as i we walked from the station the streets were dark lighted only by the average city illumination as we approached a slight ditch answering to the raising of the soil's level in the course of two thousand years and in that ditch we saw a mass of crumbling masonry huge portentously old cruel and jagged looking that was all on our left was the great modern hotel the porta nigra out facing the town lights with the glare of its restaurant and here was its ancient namesake the great gate of the old roman town of trier dull lonely unlighted two tram lines dipping into the shallow ditch passed round it like an ambulant girdle of light and then coalesced the gate is for all the world like the etoile or the marble arch but it is not riant or commonplace like those two it is grim and sardonic hopeless and left behind majestic in its indifference it has none of the well-to-do spruceness of a gate in which a concierge lives the citizens do well not to light it they merely allow it to be girt round with the rattling glaring evidence of civilization i had never seen anything like it by daylight it is hardly less portentous though the stone looks greyer more powdery and patched in places it reminded me of an old hollow tooth or of another ruin of equal producity of aspect that is the very oldest tree at burnham beeches and it is quite hollow like those majestic wrecks the custodian's room built in modern medieval times by some dead and gone bishop has fallen also to decay the arched galleries where the roman soldiers walked and sighted arrivals the conning towers whence they flashed their wireless messages are less frittered and crumbled than those trees but as the child said of the elephant 
it looks so big it can't all of it die there is no reason why these swart ungainly lumps of stone laid together and cemented with the faultless roman mortar should ever disintegrate it is not a flimsy structure like st paul's in london which the loaded trams the underground tubes can shake into disruption i saw once in childhood a picture of the porta nigra in my german history book and i recognized the original with a positive flash of gladness but the little cut over mrs markham's twelfth chapter does not give the mass of solidity of the heap of stones that came to stay and has stayed and will stay trier was roman and is roman still i felt it there keenly the continuity of races and the basic value of rome just as i do in france at carcassonne in england at old serum and in every place where rome has been has washed in pushing its irresistible tide of conquest one realizes the patient stolid plodding staying power which makes rome seem so young and vital everywhere but in rome there i am told the sense of solidity and endurance have cracked and have been burnt out with the scarifying heat and sun of centuries anyhow one never gets away from rome anywhere else why should one rome is very recent viewed with that strong sense of continuity of time which is mine the first day i was in trier i took a walk up the hills on the luxembourg side i saw the monument of eagle so like the monument at saint remy i passed the marienzoile a figure of the virgin with her crown composed of stars lit up at night by the town electric works and placed on a roman altar to some general or other i looked on the glancing white low-roofed houses of the plain the delicate deliberate slope of the arched bridges that spanned the mosel i noticed the ferry the large black cogged boat worked by pulleys and levers on the roman system then my eyes harked back to pick out the roman buildings the palace of the caesars the basilica the porta nigra isolated by its ring of tram lines and the faint tracings of the foundations of the baths the arena is hidden behind a low hill with trees there is all rome its royalty its religion its health its amusements the basilica is complete and as ugly as it ever was the small portion of the ruined palace of constantine seems as important as the whole of any ordinary restored medieval castle it makes up in massiveness and weight for what it has lost in wall space it is an empty shell granted but the shell of a rock egg or to use another zoological comparison the rotundities broadening at the base of its four bastions like an elephant's feet seem planted firmly on the soil forever yes seen from the marian her trier must have looked those few four hundred years ago when constantine fighting at neumagen made his splendid speech much as it does today and with characteristic german thoroughness the worthy dispassionate guide-books take pains to acquaint one with all the etapes of wilful neglect which the vestiges suffered at the hands of the two wanton centuries that preceded our two this generation is so proud of them the baths now they are excavated are laid out the different levels accounted for and the foundations where not even foundations exist carefully made put in the plans sold by the polite custodian but of the baths themselves there is nothing left but a few props of hypercourses, pillars, and an uneven, broken-up floor or so. It reminds one very much 
of the basement of a large London house after the housebreakers had done their worst. Still in innocent self-damnation, there are given at the back of the plan views of the buildings as they existed two centuries ago. Süd façade, bis zum Jahre 1610, and again innen aus Sicht, 1610. Both cuts show fine, upstanding groups of masonry rising to one story in most cases, sometimes to two. Portals, arches, all crumbling, but a building still, not a basement. So it is obvious that up to 1610, holes might have been stopped, lead roofs put on, necessary reparations made, a little of the civic money spent whose sum would gladly be doubled, tripled by the antiquarian societies of today. Best of all, the general process of lifting, winked at all over the world, might have been prevented instead of being encouraged. Then the stones of Trier, of Carcassonne, of Borgovicus on the Roman wall, would not have been filched. Nowadays they, quote, stop a hole to expel the winter's floor, unquote, in the cottage of some yokel, leaning slavishly against some of the grandest bits of masonry in the world. Whole villages would not have grown up like toadstools in a forest of arching trees, built of stones prigged without manorial or seigneurial reproach from the patient unconsidered ruin nearby. But nobody knew or cared anything about antiquities in those two dreadful centuries. Read Giovanni Casanova, who did his courting of the Roman girls, quote, dont quelques vieilles mines tombantes, unquote. Great chunks of villa and gate and circus, extant then and standable on, that have simply disappeared today. In those days, nature alone was worshipped, and not even nature very much on the continent. In England, a few protests were made by local antiquaries, dry as dust inhuman people like Surtees and Rain, but Strawberry Hill Gothic was not condemned, and Walter Scott collogued with these vandals in disguise and built Abbotsford. The arena at Trier has in the nature of things not suffered so deeply as the baths. There was less to carry off, only a circle of stone seats and a couple of chariot entrances, for most of the business was conducted below. The great circle has been excavated. It is all lightly grass-grown. The three tiers of seats, the two entrances, and a half dozen or so of bins at the sides for the wild beasts, which the eager crowds looked at and poked up while they waited for the real fun to begin, and the victims brought up by the lift to the trap-door and planked down, ready for the carnage. The zealous German antiquaries have excavated below. We went down, led by our old soldier of a guide, into a ghastly pit of shining mud and glassy pools of water, holding in solution all that is left of the original floor of the basement. And in recondite caverns leading off from the main underground parterre, the victims were penned. He was the lift that brought them dazed and brutalised up to the light of day and death. The mouldering joists of the lift machinery are still here. The Roman had every convenience that an inventive, a cool and calculating mind could suggest. It is one of the insane peculiarities of the tempestuous, restless German nature of Joseph Leopold that he is incapable of spending what is called a quiet evening at home. He must be out, and he must drag his womankind out with him too. When we are staying in hotels, there is some justifiable excuse for this course, at all events in German hotels, for in these there is no drawing-room, in its primary sense of with 
drawing-room when you have dined or supped you a dame or even a frau have nowhere to retire to except your bedroom or the schreibzimmer now the exceedingly unsociable and grotesque arrangement and appointments of the schreibzimmer would lead one to suppose that every german's correspondence is of a dark and secret nature but one is expected to sit severally in a sort of cubicle or bin and the traitorous movements of one's pen are hidden by a series of glass shields erected between the writer and the tenant of the next compartment there is always the smoking room i hear someone exclaim i know that my sex frequently does penetrate to this desecrated male holy of holies but that is in the larger hotels where there is of course a drawing-room as well as a lounge and it is pure feminine perversity which suggests a raid on exclusively male quarters but the adventurous female who wishes to follow her husband and share his after-dinner cigarette with him must make up her mind to reverse the proceeding and to follow her orpheus in a milder sort of hell rank with tobacco fumes its rough wooden tables littered with shoppen and pools of spilt beer a region whose reigning pluto does not want eurydice at any price it is never done i once saw two hybrid english ladies peering disconsolately into the extremely teneers like interior of the weinstuber of a certain hotel at trier looking earnestly for the usual stuffy apartment with dull stained glass windows giving on to the mews but glorious within in the style of liberty set with palms whose genesis is wrapped in scarves and dotted with tables bearing travellers bibles and hotel advertisements and pens that won't write what no drawing-room they cried and flounced out so after dinner i put a schleier over my head and we go out into the square front of the hotel zur post and turn a corner and find ourselves in one of the little narrow stone-paved streets of which the old town of trier is composed the gables of the houses seem in the dimness to peer down on us and brush our shoulders ten to one after we have been walking for five minutes or two we meet the ambulant police officer with his quiet sullen looking dog he peeps gently and with no great effect of excessive vigilance down this or that dark valley into dusky entries he examines tall port cochere where dusky forms wait and linger the german streets are the constant scene of crime and violence yet though people are nervous they are so distrustful of the police that they subscribe to watchman societies in the hopes of sleeping sounder nights as a matter of fact the german police are dishonest and untrustworthy the post of policeman is the usual appanage of a non-commissioned officer and he is no good having no traditions no point of honour he is utterly unfitted for the responsible post of guardian of the liberty of the subjects of the kaiser end of section twenty two Section twenty three of the Desirable Alien at Home in Germany by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty Trier, part two. My aunt Emma, in her lonely villa at B, resembling a villa at Surbiton or Laleham, has likewise no great opinion of her national police. So although she subscribes with her neighbours to employ a private constable to watch her door at night, she prefers to make assurance doubly sure, and sets a thief to catch a thief, as it were. A clever mechanical contrivance in the nature of a clock is attached to her front door. The trusty watchman, passing to and fro on his beat every ten minutes, 
is bound to punch the clock every time and the incorruptible instrument registers the punch so much for aunt emma who is very old and very wise for so far her watchman his morals reinforced by this clock has never failed her we go on through a maze of little quiet streets of houses interspersed by high mute-faced garden walls enclosing churchyards some of them for the long yew boughs lean over into the roadway as we wander for half an hour together all is dark mysterious and silent until the city tram like a huge perambulating night beetle all iridescent and phosphorescent in the gloom comes blundering through tickling the shutters of the houses and flattening us against the wall till it has passed and presently in pursuance of joseph leopold's nightly policy we pass through the lighted portals of one of the three homes of light and song that trier holds there is no play on at the theatre that night and no concert at the club next door only last night we took our tickets a couple of hours beforehand and returned at seven seven mind you to see del condottiere it was the history of a certain colleone who for the love of a lady betrayed venice one lady nay two even three all of them were ready to risk life and honour for the sake of colleone who was quite old and not ashamed of it this was one of the touches of realism in an otherwise romantic play everyone comes in and tells colleone that he is gaga and ought to know better but he naturally falls back on his demonstrable fascinations so lovely venetian ladies continue to be admitted at all hours in between the acts we wandered about in a large foyer very white and clean hung with portraits of great actors and drank box and coffee served from a buffet of two lovely matrons not a bit like barmaids then we went in to see colleone die impressively in his chair before the doge's throne stripped of his honours and condemned to death at least this is how i made out the byronic story but as i say there was no play on that night at all and no concert for weeks we had seen across the square from our hotel a dreary civic building of sorts which had borne in white letters the announcement tuberculosis museum and i had promised myself that one hour at least i would sup full of horrors but this evening the label had gone and the plain grey building became what it always was the cadastral and so we fell back on the pla du jour a cinematograph i had never seen a cinematograph show till i came to live in germany i was then told that england abounded in them of this wild joy was at hand had been at hand for years in the two main streets that bounded my dwelling i had never so far discovered them never known this famous form of amusement now i live in them i am only sorry that the censor has lately been allowed to have anything to do with them for now i shall never see again what i saw in the course of my first cinematograph the no joseph leopold taking upon himself the office of the much abused functionary says i am not to set down what i saw at any rate it was the triumph of the unexpected and that surely is the salt of cinematographs and entertainments generally and it was nothing wrong it was only out of place and would not have been out of place in a musical comedy nay it would have been indicated i burn to say what it was joseph leopold does not take a frivolous view of this enormous international development the cinematograph is an institution it is educational it is at any rate reading without tears Footnote. the village of kreuzberg on april the fourteenth nineteen thirteen allocated fifty pounds of its yearly revenue to purchasing seats for poor children at the local cinematographs on sundays throughout the year j l f m h end footnote 
it is vastly inducive of a philosophical attitude of mind it is a vivid cogent object lesson in the sequence of events the couple of stories usually given historical cosmopolitan revelatory of varieties of national character as even the more laughable films are must be provocative of something like the prophetic powers that a study of history past and present gives a hochspannender's detective drama may in its details pander to a vulgar taste but it is pretty certain to reach the level of the intelligence it is designed to impress possibly some forger has been turned from his wickedness some fool from his folly some potential murderer from his crime by the sight of one of these dramas of financial ruin of blood and revenge even though owing to the obvious imperfection of the medium blood cannot run red or the face of the ruined man blanch it is better so it is better as shakespeare's helena said that quote, the white death should sit on their cheeks for ever for the coloured films are abominable but as it is i should not mind wagering that conscience money has been paid as a result of some evenings spent in a red plush-coloured armchair with an antimacassar slung over the back of it a square of tawdry lace that is apt to follow you out into the street and are no simple souls induced to a more tolerant rule of piety after seeing say the bell-ringer where the devil terrifies the ancient functionary from ringing the angelus and only gives him leave to pursue his calling on condition that the devil shall take the first soul that enters the church while the bell is ringing it is hard on the soul but the philosophy of the scapegoat is sound enough the innocent since medieval times must suffer for the guilty and an angel from heaven her wide wings disguised under a beggar's cloak enters the church and rings the bell for the charitable old bell-ringer who has stooped in the porch to succour her this is of course a film which would not obtain in a protestant town and others which i have seen in germany would be prohibited in england for the sake of the young person people rail in england against this large looming personage and her invasion of the library committees and the stalls of the problem plays so dear to the english soul but we have a short way with her in germany english people who have a reasonable zest for seeing life as it is complain that they are driven by their parental susceptibilities to read milk and water stuff and view plays that are only fit for babes but no one suggests that the onus of chaperonage might be thrown on the police as it is in germany and the young person deaf to the moral suasion of parents kept by armed force from the book or the play instead of the play or the book from the young person yet it is practically so in germany as far as the theatre is concerned reasonable plays are put on and enjoyed by the elders an angel with a flaming sword stands at the gate of the theatrical eden and forbids the young of both sexes to enter paradise before their time that is eighteen years old the chief of police prescribes to what place the young men and maidens under this age shall be admitted or no and places a simple policeman at the doors of the theatre to enforce his behest and as for children of tender years the germans see that the lesson shall not be too strong too deeply driven home to the tender intelligence when a film that may prove a bugbear is presented or one holding the powers that be up to execration or vilifying the army or any other lawfully constituted authority children are not allowed to enter at all it is impossible for local governments to take such a tender interest in the morals of their subjects without the conflict of authorities producing some odd results it must never be forgotten that germany is a mass of little ill-welded nationalities 
all under a first warlord. That is what the Kaiser literally is. The curious local jealousies existing between one state and another are the unknown factor, and make a topsy turviness which, in operation, remind one of an opera of Gilbert and Sullivan. There is one famous film, Heises Blut, which was prohibited in Frankfurt and forbidden to be performed in Trier. That is why I was able to see it in H dash, because H dash is in Hessen Darmstadt, not in Prussia. And it is really, as its name denotes, a Spannendes drama. A beautiful and famous Danish actress has played in the preparation of the film the part of the woman of strong passions united to a gentleman unable to satisfy them. She casts her affection on the new chauffeur and makes an assignation with him during her husband's absence. He returns and surprises the pair and turns the temperamental lady and her lover out of the house. The degraded one becomes a burglar's mate and we see her in a thieves' kitchen concocting a plan for the breaking into her former abode. She is persuaded by a truculent chauffeur lover to dress as a boy, to scale the window and let him in. She naturally chooses the nursery window. By her boy's cot, the ex-husband finds her. She confesses, and he takes her back. Och, spannendes indeed. For novelists, like Joseph Leopold and me, the rage for picture theatres is a distinct gain. It may be the novel form of the future. When there will be so many books published that no one has time to read them, the author, wise before his time, will devote his intelligence to the presentation of his message, whatever it is, through this hasty medium, to all who will not wait for the development of style, niceties of dialogue and so on. It is not perhaps generally known that the actors who take the parts of characters in a film accompany all their gestures for the sake of ressemblance with speeches appropriate thereto, half gag, half set down for them. But without envisaging such a total abnegation of the merits of style in the future, let us see that, in so far as the present condition of things affects authors, they have all to gain by the tales that are told nightly in dumb show. The audience, composed pretty nearly of rustics in the classical sense, unsophisticated, unlettered, slow at apprehending the contortions, the mysteries of a good plot, will gradually get more and more used to following its peripatetics, tracing out the issues, holding the multiple strands that go to make a story, weaving them gradually, skilfully into the main one till by the time the light suddenly grows in the saal and the pate cock seems to stand on the empty sheet and crow triumphant, the whole has grown coherent in their minds. It is magnificent training for readers. We see in Das Gefährliche Alter, another good German film, the spendthrift at the restaurant confronted by La Douloureuse and the elegant harpy who has cost him so dear at his side egging him on get the money to pay for it her speech is given in writing on a board but it is hardly necessary the context is explanatory enough the slide shifts we see his mother weeping over her secretaire where notes for fifty pounds are tumbling about mixed with correspondence cards as they will in the desks of mothers in films. We see her go to bed, and in the next slide her son appears, walking in the peering, creepy way which is suggestive of proposed criminal attempts on secretaires, and so on and so on, to a mother's inevitable forgiveness. Yes, I consider the advent of the Boy Scouts, the invention of picture postcards, and the rage for picture theatres as the three most important developments of this age of brass and iron. I began this book with a procession. I will begin to end it with one. 
the stateliness of a king of england's coronation its proud aloofness has no parallel in this lively bourgeois city of trier where incapable policemen are jostled by the crowds they marshal and even the imperious military are not taken seriously on a day of feasting and i remembered that orderly and well-dragooned crowd in front of parliament square on june the twenty second nineteen eleven when the police had carefully winnowed and mown the street of possible suffragettes and incidentally of all the people who had come to see other people but here in trier i was glad enough of joseph leopold's tidy german circumference as we pushed our way through the narrow streets in the thickest bluffest crowd i ever found myself in the occasion was the hundredth jahrfeier of the kaiserin augusta quote, verbunden mit kornblumentag in trier unquote. a deeply nationally beloved queen she was her picture in the programme shows her a quiet determined sage lady her head wrapped in a schleier becoming her age the corn bloomer is her flower blue is the prussian colour and the loyal inhabitants of trier were glad to link up a historischer festzug with her day and promote a festival of the nature of one of the pageants they arrange so often in england nowadays to stir up the dormant histrionic and spectacular talent of the old maids of provincial towns the programme began at seven with military vecken from eight o'clock onwards helfen der damen sold favours in the streets cornblumen picture postcards and programmes hastily of the first helfen der damen who came along smiling with a basket full of the small blue cornflowers joseph leopold purchased a couple of sower blooms and stuck them about us both he was right for we were besieged by more beautiful ladies each clamouring like any enterprising fishwife for us to buy her particular wares the sight of the corn bloom and pinned on our coats purchased of a colleague stilled and daunted the others somewhat and we were allowed to pass along to the places we had secured corn bloom and for months afterwards surged into my ken from wardrobes and letter cases and trunks we had been obliged in the end to buy dozens of these tickets of leave we got at last to the stand erected in the old market-place with the two great churches on the one side and the old house of councillor k with its hot sulphurous looking painted gables on the other the procession began with the usual heralds a sort of plain bread and butter course before the cake and jam of the important entries after the foregrouper came a very telling and to germanize pleasant scene of germans after a successful fight leading home the captive romans in chains and ox carts laden with spoil that is how twas even my mrs markham says so the german warriors were a hairy set of people covered with skins and gold bangles and wearing helmets crowned with the horns of every known beast a personage called on the programme Hermann de Koruskefürst followed them. Mrs. Markham had not enlightened me as to him, and I puzzled in vain to discover if Keruske wasn't a German way of spelling Merovingian. You see, I had a better drawn literary picture in my mind, Carlyle's, of the quote, Merovingian kings wending slowly on their bullet carts through the streets of Paris with their long hair flowing unquote. carlyle's few words have forever made me see the great eyes of clovis and merove full of the unassuaged wild melancholy and savagery of primitive conquerors and rulers i look at their presentations in frescoes and statues and imagine them saying always a quoi bon and these travestied actors and apprentices and shopmen of trier as i suppose they were posing as neustrians and austrasians clad temporarily in such impossible unspeakable garb easily suggested by their gloom and gaucherie and wish i were at home air the necessary touch of verisimilitude then mit seinem gefolge 
came the greatest man Europe has ever been privileged to see, according to Joseph Leopold, Kaiser Karl der Grosse. The German who impersonated Charmaine seemed a little weighted by his importance. I think he was an actor. He had an ab all to himself. He was followed by an overbalanced section comprising Barbarossa, looking very shy in his immense red wig, and Henry the Lion with knights and standard bearers galore. The next part, without an interval, struck me in my limited Mrs. Markham bounded knowledge of German history as a tremendous leap across the centuries to the Thirty Years' War. There was an end of impersonators cluttered up with wigs and skins and bangles. Instead, we had dignified gentlemen in coats and cocked hats and gold lace, Generalissimus Field Marshal Wallenstein and Piccolomini. And I thought of the pathetic plaint of Thekla. Du heiliger, rufe dein Kind zurück. Ich habe genossen das irdische Glück. Ich habe gelebt und geliebet. But everybody has not ploughed through the Piccolomini and read the tale of Wallenstein's defaulting general and his daughter's fate. Not Joseph Leopold, for instance, who gazed unswayed by sentiment on the long procession of the real victims of Tilly and Wallenstein, that is, the Landsknechte and Bauern, samples of the hapless peoples whose homesteads were sacked and burned, whose fields were the marching grounds for thirty years of the armies of these selfish contending dynasties. The fifth part dealt with the time of the great Kurfürsten and Frederick William and his big grenadiers, and the sixth part, which took as long again as any of the others to unroll, with Frederick the Great and his general Zieren and Schweren and the romantic figure of the old Dessauer, most people have a weakness for the old Dessau because of his mad passion for Annalisa, the apothecary's daughter. It was not at first admitted by his family, but once, when he came back from some campaign or other to be covered with honours, the young impulsive fellow was not to be found to receive them. Where is he? cry court chamberlains, gold sticks in waiting pages and all. At last some unconsidered menial hazards the suggestion er ist bei dem apotheke and sure enough leopold of anhalt dessau placing his sweetheart before all honours and claims of family had run straight to her and there was nothing to be done but give him his wish and marry him to the apothecary's daughter it goes on the tramp of soldiers feet the trommeln and pfeifen corps the Freiheitskampfer, the Lutzauer Freihussaren and Scheidhussaren, and endless military figures on horseback with names that stow one. Theodor Kröner, Gneisner, Scharnhorst von Horn, and General Field Marshal Blücher, and then the Einigungskriegen and its authors, General Field Marshal von Moltke, Kriegsminister von Rhön, and Fürst Bismarck. This is German history, and where was William I? The great dignified figures sitting negligently on horseback with serious faces, the gold galloon showing under their cloaks, passed and gave way to a parade of modern weapons and uniforms, a coarse show of warlike strength, almost paralyzing in its suggestion of completeness, and following, Spielleute, Infanterie, Jäger und Schutzen, Maschinengewehr komplett, Pioniere, Fussartillerie, Feldartillerie und Kavallerie, and last but not least, after die Rote Kreuz Sanitätstruppe, came the saddest post-reflection on all these splendors, unsere Veteranen, old, worn, battered, like wind-tossed, rain-faded scarecrows, the men of 1870 paraded their honourable caducity along the sunshiny, wind-swept street. In rows of four they tottered along. Some could walk, and some could only drive. 
In carriagefuls of four these drove slowly by. They did not look happy or prosperous. Dazed, they seemed, half puzzled, half annoyed by the light, these ghosts of a warlike past, dragged away from their chimney corners, where they were permitted to dream away in penurious decency the rest of a life whose youth was devoted to the Kaiser. They had lived through it, just. One could hardly picture them as they were then, bold, strong, erect, and kind. Yes, they were kind. France owns it. Of all the procession of mummers, these were the real thing, the grey, mourn reality of war. The rest was fake. But this was silence. End of section 23section twenty four of the desirable alien at home in germany by violet hunt this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty one take us the little foxes part one in those last days of september nineteen hundred and eleven there breathed over all south germany a spirit of breathless calm such a calm says euripides as preceded the advent of the supreme beauty and good of Helen. The promise of the vivid and portentous summer was about to be fulfilled, and over this land where forever the words seemed to whisper, Take us the little foxes, the little foxes that eat the grapes, the spirit of the vine brooded over her nurslings, as they were being brought to pure perfection in the deep peace of seasonable days and only a year before the rhinelanders were in mourning the aspect of germany's divinest product was pitiable indeed even to the eyes of a comparative outsider the little mysterious plants on which so much depended were still stiffly upstanding showed no weakness though they were drenched with rains harried by cold gusts consumed to the heart by mildew yet all the while the pernicious stamp was eroding the leaves and rotting the grapes in the bunch the fruit was not worth gathering and nobody gathered it but passed the vines moribund in their thousands with more or less averted gaze the whole vine crop was ruined but in this year that I was permitted to see fulfil its promise, it was not so. The outrageous summer of which we had all complained, that was Europe's poison, was at least the South Germans' meat. And the autumn weather, during the fateful three weeks that precede the accomplishment of the vintage, deigned to be propitious for the health of these nacreous balls of green jelly, whose force and sweetness is bound to make the world's stored gaiety for the next ten years and more that vintage was a record vintage and bottled joy without a headache in a hogshead bearing on its cork faces the impressive four figures will for a full decade be sought after and prized it was the hottest summer since fourteen hundred and fifty three the summer bred no rotting root destroying rains only towards autumn came such beneficent natural mists as do not pierce and suck into the soul of the grape but merely bathe the skins gently considerately in a soothing and stimulating moisture soft skies and cloudless hung over the vine hills and over an utterly happy people going about the businesses that occupied them for forty-nine weeks of the year but stealing now and then a possessive glance at the parterre of vines that marches with the road they are travelling or gazing up craning their necks at the precipitous crags where perhaps their own vines hang they are thinking of that time so near when from grey dawns through broad days into the very heart of dim moonlights 
breathlessly the harvest of their hopes will be gathered the eye of their thought sees the stems stripped the grapes squeezed and pressed weighed tested and paid for squeezed again and sent through pipes into the barrels of the cellars below there the last long stage ere the juices reach their throats and ours is consummated in an absolute and secret darkness in italy i suppose for i have never been there all at this season is colour and excitement flamboyant valdetti gorgeous purple wine presses and barefoot fawn-like peasants dancing down the foaming must to the twanging of the zither and the bagpipe in france the wildest passions have sway they tell me pleasure turned to pain and riot and the free blood of the vine spilt in the furrow in the streets even not in love but in hate footnote this is a suggestio falsi the french wine grower is a vastly less jovial man than the german he is also immeasurably more scientific in his methods both of growing and of picking if he rioted the other day it was because of the bitter seriousness with which he takes his profession and wine ran in the streets mixed with a little blood the germans would have drunk it all up j l f m h in footnote but here on the broad rhine on the mosel and the Saar, broad streams too here in my adopted country as far as i can see reigns the true pax germanica no noise no sound of quarrelling but an almost sabbatical hush as the yearned for time draws near it is all temperate concentrated anticipation in the little vine villages i noticed many a day before the picking the smart red and green wine presses piled in joiners shops stacked at the corners of streets being washed clean in the dun gloom of outhouses in readiness for the day of days on that day they will be placed in carts and the carts will be driven away to stand somewhere as near the field of labour as the oxen can drag them up the steep and slaty roads and all the pairs of hands will be commandeered to work while long slow chorales of praise and benison shall rise between the furrows i say day of days but luckily every vineyard is not ready to be gathered on the same day the ripeness of each hill varies according to the position the soil the degree of care expended and scientific cultivation but during those three weeks before the laser it is true that i was impressed by the sight of quiet satisfied men and women dressed not in striking colours but in plain hot and grey going about with the calm light of pleasurable expectation on their faces giving their thanks at wayside shrines where they obviously vowed from the depths of their simple and devout hearts peace to men of good will because this was such a good vintage year they did not dance to piferari or sing to the sound of zithers but the true lyric note of thankfulness was in their voices as they mumbled the obligatory tug of civility tug they always said passing me on the road or looking down on me from the carts those long wagons made of two ladders and drawn by two oxen piled with empty baskets and the scarlet and emerald wine press thrown in the middle on their way to the vineyards and many of the vineyards are very distant and some of them almost inaccessible here in the proper vine country the crop is set anywhere everywhere up and down ravines across and beyond streams perched in every possible coin of a mountainous and jagged landscape if only it may there catch the sun the poor man whose means do not admit of the purchase of good level sites lays a little soil on the bare rock plants waters tends and grows his few bushels as well as he can this is the lowest humblest end of the scale but the point is that there is no peasant of this countryside who does not possess be he never so poor some little corner of a vineyard and on this account is the joy of a good vintage so universal in the land 
on the top of the scale are the domains of the great vine handlers with their tall buildings like factories and vast machinery of distribution the peasants mostly join together to found cooperative pressing associations called vincevereins and there are the landed magnates with their purchased or inherited estates situated on high appropriate pinnacles of rock topped by feudal castles the robber strongholds of fiction and a very real historic fact either their ancestors have lived in these castles time out of mind as in the case of the owners of the famous schlossels or they have purchased them and rendered them habitable and tastelessly magnificent ruin or habitation such a favoured site is rigorously devoted to the culture of the vine the modern german seigneur has no use for the handsome approach for those park-like grounds embosoming his mansion which figure in the english agent's advertising circular he prefers to grow the romantic grape up to his very doorstep if so be that grapes will grow the vines at schloss braunfels and braubach seem to creep up and peer into the very windows and doubtless the sight of so much property that is at once poetic and realisable affords the lord thereof considerable pleasure and the commercial millionaire geheimrat owner of the famous castle at sea dash instead of looking down as his predecessor might have done from his robber fastness a modernised schloss perched high over the town and dominating the mosel valley instead of looking down on fat convoys of merchandise which at some slight personal risk he would presently descend to harry and appropriate can sit quietly at home in his modern medieval armchair and gaze out of the window at his so practicable wealth lying all round him it is his very own secured to him and his heirs by no desperate deed but by the power of the purse and the getting of the best chemical advice afforded by a paternal government yes he may sit there the live long day with his august and titled house-party from berlin or frankfurt and muse upon the beauty of utility but that is not the view of mr george moore who in his latest book declares that he knows nothing more unpicturesque than a vineyard and the quote a hillside planted with them is abhorrent end quote no one could surely be less teutonic in sympathy than mr george moore but even an alien who wishes to be as placable as possible may concede that at a little distance the effect of the neat plantation is somewhat hard bernkastel kochem braubach and the other feudal towers that crown nearly every peaked hill in germany manage to carry it off the regular rows of vines creeping up like an army of green spears like burnham wood come to dunsinane seem to culminate duly enough in the little collection of sharp turrets that break out at the top and surmount the rising tides of green and all along the rhine the enormous height of the hills renders their clothing negligible as it were the hides of mastodons gigantic and couchant but indeed the comparatively low hills that border the mosel and the Tsar suggest to me rather the shaggy loins of short rough-coated dogs clipped down to the quick one misses of course the soft swathing clumps of foliage that clothe the slopes of the hills in england or belgium we will say that answers to the fur that covers the haunches of a newfoundland or a collie we do not get the modulations of colour that will be given by the inequalities of size and shape of the different trees and bushes but there is always the other bank as mr moore's patient friend edward martin pointed out yes it is higher and steeper the professional grumbler replies there are trees but and here is a sentence which every desirable alien should burn to avenge with every drop of her newly naturalized blood the trees in germany seem to lose their beauty they clothe the hillside like gigantic asparagus 
nonsense. Has our only realist, who once placed a haystack in Peckham, never read his Tacitus, or heard of the monstrous oaks of the Black Forest, the High Eiffel, the Teutoburger Forest, or the Harz? I should rather like to see Mr. Moore set down before one of these on toast. To me, the vine plant taken singly is a pathetic object. The small pyramidal valuable thing appears so frail and tottery, each plant standing ever so little apart from its fellows, as if fully conscious and proud of its small but important individuality, reminds me of a Morkin at a fair, a doll dressed up like an early Victorian lady in a gala gown, flounced right up to the waist, and the flounces composed of soft taffeta silk of faintly differing shades. Or if we must have Irish similes, like the late Lady Wilde, who dressed exactly like this, for the leaves grow all round in tears, and have some of them a curious uncanny coppery sheen. Those that have been chemically treated look iridescent, a deadly poisonous brown in the shadows, and of a sinister greyish blue where the light strikes them. No. I should not care to be left alone in a carefully kept vineyard in the magic time of evening when the sun has declined in the sky and the fleeting shafts of sunset catch the swart tips of the leaves and like an enchanter's wand point out the evil pathological smears and stains that pass unnoticed in broad daylight. But I am falling into the pathetic fallacy which Mr. Ruskin spent a whole chapter in condemning in modern painters. It was the endeavour and constant custom of Herr Cramp, the landlord of the Hotel Prince Karl in Treves and a great vine-grower, to have a look in on as many of his vineyards as was possible at this season, consistently with the other calls on his time and attention. We asked him to let us accompany him on one of these occasions, and he ratified his dignified consent with one of those slow, sudden smiles of his that we had grown used to. His moon face with the button mouth had something oriental about it. It was usually puckered into a due gravity, but now and again it melted into such a sweet and cynical curve as I fancy the mouth of the Pied Piper of Hamlin may have worn when he stepped into the streets, quote, smiling first a little smile, unquote. He had no English. He had been chef in some large hotel in the United States, the Waldorf Astoria, I believe, and he sometimes, but not often, exchanged his native language for that of America. I once observed him fondling a fine fat boy tucked up in a perambulator outside the hotel, and asked him politely whose baby it was. His laconic reply, mine, sure, was a masterly blending of German unctuosity and American dryness. Yes, he had been a chef, but the cooking at his hotel was bad. So he thought, but did not say. Even this truly superb cellar could not wash away the memory of those dreary, flavourless, unblessed dishes. Sander gebak mit Butter and Junger Hahn mit something else. Junger Han, that would ever see three again. We never complained because our rooms were so clean. And anyone who has lived in England knows that cleanliness, coming next to godliness, infallibly somehow or other means cuisine à l'eau. Later on, Herr Cramp volunteered this piece of information unsought. He said that at the beginning of his career as chef at the Waldorf Astoria, he had given his clients the best he knew but that he soon found that no one in the city of haste had the leisure to discriminate between his successes and his failures, so that at last he had lost all heart for his art, and not even returning to his fatherland, where, as a rule, cooking does not in all its items resemble warm, moist, pink India rubber or gummy sawdust. Even his repatriation had not given him back any gusto of the casserole, but if his kitchen neither enthralled him nor occupied much of his time, 
his cellars certainly did this and more the wine trade and the hotel trade seem to go very kindly hand in hand in germany herr kramp's brother also a weinhandler was the landlord of another hotel in the city and his father who was staying with him all through this auspicious season of the grape was the landlord of an important hotel in thuringia and was also a wine merchant the father was a more commonplace type he had the air of a vieux militaire and an enormous paunch which he wore not in the least deprecatingly though he acknowledged its inconvenience and he accompanied us on that particular grey day in september to a certain vineyard which his son owned near trittenheim on the mosel trittenheim is the next village to Kusrath, which figures in the guide-books as the longest village in germany for it is merely a mile-long double row of houses a backbone with no ribs and there is no railway to it exactly but we understood that we could make the little mosel barn serve and our legs too the train would drop us at a village where there was a convenient ferry across to the sunnier bank where the vineyards were the small train took us very slowly turning and twisting in obedience to all the bends of the river the carriages have vast plate glass windows so that passengers can feast their eyes step by step or sleeper by sleeper on the schöne aussichten there are tables fixed in the centre of each handsome saloon carriage covered with the usual red checked tablecloth i never drink rhine or mosel wine or even beer for the matter of that without thinking of a tablecloth with red squares a brass fiddle such as one has on board ship was placed across it to retain the glasses and the slippery napery as well for of course people drink when and where they happen to be thirsty in germany they have not to go to a special indispensable emporium for drink as they are obliged to do in england they do not drink beer for in the wine country that is regarded as a social crime so it was mosel wine the attendants supplied as a matter of course and there they sat joseph leopold and the two cramps with their glasses in their hands and the priest with a breviary in his amiably discussing the vintage and the prices current of the grape the mosel is about as wide as the thames at marlow or goring but by no stretch of the imagination could i have thought it was the thames it looks so lazy and it is so swift in the path that the line was now marching with it is not navigable little spits of shore manoeuvred into breakwaters run out from the south bank the side on which we were travelling i did not notice any on the other there the reddish earth shelves in and is undercut just as the banks of the thames deplorably are though there are no steamers here to do it with their wash straggling herbs and flowers grow on it as the melilot and the willow grow at goring and pangbourne but still it does not look the same it looks wilder as children would say haunted as their elders might feel especially as i saw it to-day flattened out under low grey clouds quote, a stream that hears the flowing of all men's tears beneath the sky unquote yes that was it it was haunted there was something unearthly in its opaque grey-green calm its steady relentless cynical flow through a region abandoned perhaps under a curse a country seen in a dream through glass no not a curse a spell such as according to holy grim in the old knock-kneed wall-eyed witch has power to throw it was the day it was the place when two eyes whose envious sisters three eyes and one eye could not endure her because she so exactly like other people sat down on the ridge of grass it is there to-day it forms one of the breakwaters of this undammed river to cry because she had not enough to eat here it was that the prince who is happily always at hand to succour unmerited misfortune in these sociologistic tales 
came to her and asked her why she was crying. I imagine him in the gilt scales of a Roman centurion, girt with a short sword, with bare golden locks, and arms and face dyed by the same sun that colours the grape, till they have the colour of newly tanned leather. It was here, too, that the persecuted princess with the unprepossessing but royal attribute of hair made of gold and silver in equal proportions leant over the river's brim to drink and wrought a spell so that the little hat of conrad the neat herd flew away and he could not touch her hair that he had so presumptuously admired for she was a king's daughter and carried portable spells about with her as a modern princess would carry her card-case and her smelling salts this lady possessed three drops of blood wrapped in a napkin that her royal mother had given her and as she leant down to drink the napkin floated away down the stream and the three drops of blood spoke for her when the time came that is the story a little farther on was the rustic bridge that the fisherman bent over when he was sad to gaze into the stream until a beautiful nix raised her head from the ripples and spoke to him kindly and comforted him yes they might all have been there these shy heroes and heroines of my youth it was by them that the stream was haunted a succession of little red-roofed villages came in sight bend of the river followed bend the steep cliffs of the banks covered with the shaggy vines and more quiet pastures Today, the vines did not hang formal and lonely the gatherers were crawling about among the patches like black and white ants unrecognizable from the opposite bank as human beings it made the hills appear to be alive to be moving indeed all the world was out there picking grapes some little town is emptied of its folk joseph leopold quoted having joined me at the window then came another sudden and outrageous bend and another of these empty little towns came into view and then more wide hillsides covered with human ants i questioned every now and then as in a fairy story is that your vineyard herr cramp and the answer was always noch weiter a little farther on at last we left the train at unheim where there was a convenient ferry for the vine slopes we embarked on an ancient boat with a still more ancient ferryman so ancient that he might well have been he whom st christopher hailed on that wild black and surely german night when the christ child called across the rushing stream we were slowly dreamily floated across the shallows amid the sound of the ripple on the boughs mingled with the soft hum of vine talk End of section 24section 25 of the desirable alien at home in germany by violet hunt this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 21 take us the little foxes part 2 a little later in the afternoon we were landed on the working bank and started to walk back a long way to Herr Kramp's vineyard. We went in Indian file, the river just below us, and the vineyards precipitously ascending at our sides. Herr Kramp senior, with his paunch, waddled swiftly. The last of the file of us, we had a couple of miles to go, and I felt some pangs of consideration for his eighty years over the path that slippery and narrow climbed now to the shale of the vineyards and then plunged down amid blackberry thickets down to the very water-smoothed marble boulders of the stream bed itself but i soon left off pitying him or deprecating the length of the excursion on his behalf because it was quite easy to tell that of all the four of us he it was who most thoroughly enjoyed it he was having the time of his life and they were not his own vines or even his son's 
shouting singing yodelling throwing out expletives the old man blundered along ravishing huge bunches of himmelschöner trauben from the vine stocks as he passed one estate after the other he offered them to us broadcast for his son was a very great vine handler in that part of the country and we were all privileged persons there is no paling no apparent division no fence between the properties you have but to stretch out your hand to help yourself yet joseph leopold says there is no stealing it would not be patriotic and it would not be worth while as a matter of fact between one allotment and another there is usually by way of a term or landmark an iron pole set up on this there will be an enamelled label and on these labels you may read the mighty names of the gebrüder deinhardt or the Königer domaine or the names of the smallest peasants all that day i was eating grapes in one day i ate more grapes than i had ever eaten in my life not excepting the time when i had scarlet fever and lost my taste for the things that swell to enormous purple tastelessness in english hothouses for evermore from the hands of all four of us depended continuously bunches of grapes grapes quenched our thirsts grapes ballasted us on the rocky marble pinnacles beside the shallows the juice of grapes streamed from our mouths and with that same juice were our hands wet as fast as we had partaken of the produce of one vineyard we were invited to test another's it was what one might call a grape crawl and i wondered if the hardened sinners male and female in england slouching drearily past one public house after another in rain and mud and sleet would not have enjoyed the harmless variety of the unintelligent pursuit as much as the gin crawl perhaps not perhaps the male sot and female drudge would have replied like the sated duchesse de longueville que voulez-vous que je vous dise je n'aime pas les plaisirs innocents glorious splendid praise the lord the fine old german gentleman behind me muttered polishing off one bunch after another stripping round globe after round globe off from its stalk as he walked along and from time to time indeed he burst into a shout at the sight of a laden tree such a real shout and roar of praise that i thought at first not knowing his dialect very well that he was enraged at the misdeeds rather than overjoyed at the good fortune of his neighbours and all the while we were stripping the round globes from the wet stalks i should not have dared for a moment to drop to the ground the fleshy envelope of the god of herr kramp's adoration and there was no need to do so the skins were quite soft and no hand but my own had ever touched them and old herr kramp's pen was one of the most gratifying and spiritually beautiful workings of the mind that i have ever witnessed to hear him break forth into jubilation and thanksgiving to see him craning up stretching his troublesome stomach longitudinally as he raised his short arms prolonged by a forked stick to pull down into his purview the boughs of fruit-bearing trees that fringed the vineyards and became more common as we approached the villages all these things the ejaculations smiles roars of joyful laughter the whole being of the man stretched to express satisfaction and gratitude all these things seemed to be an essay in pure thanksgiving as one might make essays in the art of pure music or pure art for the sake of the art all these things seemed since none of the fruit trees were his nor the vines to render more pleasant and more good that great green landscape that lay beneath a sky like a jewel 
and a sun that hung breathless and motionless as if it gazed with wonder upon its own work it was pure religion a simple piety for although just now the vine was the thing and the sky was actually grey he could take an interest in all the other kindly fruits of the earth and the other harvests of this remarkable year that seemed for so long to have lain beneath the sky and that sun that it was difficult to gaze upon them in the greyness and forget that of which they were the real expression so that it seemed that the fruits themselves radiated a tranquil sunshine and apples plums and pears the reddest the purplest i have ever seen except the shiny produce of the dominion of canada that one sees behind plate glass at the top of whitehall and that seem monstrous and unreal as if they had been fabricated out of waxes and soaps plums and pears showed me their blushing beauties one after the other as the boughs that bore them were pulled down for a moment and allowed to fly back again by the enthusiastic old fellow and now i know the meaning of that verse of the english litany that i had so often heard droned out without unction or emotion in numberless village churches in poor rain-sodden caprice-ridden england i am alluding to the caprice of the elements wrought on an unfortunate island of which no spot on an average is farther away from the sea than eighty miles an island swept continually by the sea fret and dominated by the mountain gloom the kindly fruits of the earth so that in due time we may enjoy them the irony of it how not admire the proud patience that finds in shakespeare's lines a precious stone set in a silver sea a panacea for tariff bills and a climate that has no equal for contrariness in germany too there are elemental reverses but they are not normal the vine crop may be ruined by the rain in one dismal year like nineteen ten but a good year coming once in seven will restore the balance and 1911 was more than a good year, it was a superb year. The cultivation of the vine depends more than any other avocation on the personal care bestowed on it. The personal care of a perspicacious and experienced cultivator. It is an expensive business to begin with. Good plants and planting will cost anything up to forty pounds an acre, and then, given a fairly decent soil, the growth must be nursed and tended like a baby for six or seven years before it will show signs of bearing a paying crop. It must be heavily manured, and the manure, and everything, must be carried as a rule on men's backs. There is no other way. In some cases the plot lies so steeply as to be almost perpendicular and always the ground is so covered with shale and loose rock that the cultivator has difficulty even in keeping his foothold even the very soil has often to be carried up literally in hodsful much in the same way or so we were told at our mother's knee the bare volcanic rock of malta was prepared for human cultivation as the caddy at golf places a little heap of sand for the ball to rest on so the soil has been laid and here and there the absolutely unplantable crests and peaks of basalt jut out from the mat of green that seems to mount them knee high some of these peaks have been cleverly blasted into terraces banked up as it were by a naked wall of rock that shines out white as milk the surface has been whitewashed in order to reflect the maximum of light and heat for the vines the sun the poetry and life of the vine above and below the manure the prose manure well though there is not much that is creditable about it yet there is a great deal that is macabre and grotesque for the vine is said to prefer some very strange varieties of composts 
leather is favoured by the capricious plant an old pair of boots is very sovereign and if you want the vine at your door to flourish and attain unto the very roof tree you had better ensure its growth by first laying down an old leather portmanteau before you plant it one is driven to think of an older and more savage form of what may be after all a mere superstition though joseph leopold swears that it is a chemical fact did ever the body of a young child fructify a vineyard in the olden days or at best the unconsidered body of a captive or a slave and back go one's thoughts to the legend of dionysius and the sacrificial knife seems to be flourished over the dark soil when springs the dark twisted stock nay further back to the first feast of the passover when the lintels of the doors were washed in blood in england to-day you may hear the echo of the savage notion in the chant of the hordes of the regenerate as they roam through quiet country villages on the seventh day washed in the blood of the lamb the officers of the salvation army like the priests of old do not probably suffer from too much imagination as all unconscious of the terrible traditional force of the words they shout their terrible refrain for an hour or so and then go in to their well-earned teas and to be sure the family cramp did not think of these things as we walked indian file along the narrow path weltering vineyards upon the one hand and the calm mosel on the other the son's little button mouth was pinched in calculation the father's toothless one was roaring out te deum laudamus the carts with wine presses ready poised in them stood about waiting for their loads the brimming hods full that peasants were all the while carrying to them down the steep hillsides when the bearers had descended to the carts they climbed up short ladders and upset the hods into the wine presses very much as the english dustman empties refuse into the barrack cart with an oof of relief for hours they had come stumbling down the narrow tracks which were all the space the owners of the vineyards have been able to spare for transport on these channel beds like mere watercourses where torrential rains seemed only yesterday to have rushed down there lay enough loose stones to make a careless step dangerous to men burdened as these porters were with enormous receptacles filled by the women pickers up among the vines they are shaped like a dustman's basket and strapped onto the back of the porter they are sometimes made of osier work or leather but most often of a green painted metal which has the effect of making the grape carriers appear like shard beetles or men in armour some of them emptied their hods into the carts the rest went straight down to the ferry boats which were waiting to take them and their burdens just as they stood to the village on the other side when half a score men backed by their hods packed into the boat they were nearly lost to sight behind the enormous stack of metal they bore their heads appeared to peep modestly round the corners of the hods and one imagined a boat full of armed warriors hiding behind their bronze shields sheltering from arrows one man sat like a bonze in his cart behind the wine press that was full of grapes he was offering them as samples as we passed herr kramp calm suave imperturbable handled a bunch tasted a grape and lingered behind for a few seconds otto said his father complacently is doing business when herr kramp rejoined us he had just bought the entire produce of that man's vineyard about nine thousand gallons of must he was as composed nay more so as a stockbroker who has successfully bared some stock on wall street and we all went quietly on to the communal wine press at Cluserat, where these grapes will be tested and paid for and i should taste for the first time in my life 
the foaming must of poetry we walked past the landlord's own vineyard to which he gave only a cursory glance for he had visited it the day before we went in still eating grapes through the cobbled streets of villages each bearing some one of the favoured names that one sees on the labels of bottles dotted about on london supper tables till we came to a damp dark-looking but not unclean building whose stone courtyard was full of carts disgorging their slippery shiny loads in most of these carts a woman stood like a goddess demeaning herself with something like a trident the wine-press gaping for the grapes was perched high on the cart and she was by way of hastening matters for there is no time to lose on one cart the whole family was apparently engaged in possing as the washerwomen say in the north of england pressing bumping down wet masses of green globes that already below bursting with their own weight right up in the tub like a sea of mottled and yeasty green all those hearty girls and boys had been helping to gather the day was hot they had taken off their coats and their jackets and their wraps of all sorts and had piled them on the cart it was a pell-mell of grapes exquisite ethereal grapes the beginning to look a little worse for the wear and the gross material trappings of poor heated humanity and every one like herr cramp will have you taste every one is flourishing a sample bunch in your face and imploring you to try to refuse would be churlish and one has to forget quote, the dyer's hand subdued to what it works in unquote. we all went inside Herr Cramp was much too busy to speak. He was a great man, and he was buying more grapes. He was buying, I understood, this particular man's grape juice straight off the cart, and he was having the quality tested hodful by hodful as they were brought in and turned out into the communal press placed over a tub. There are two wheels in the bottom of this utensil that work into each other, toothed and close-fitting, whilst the attendant turns the handle at the side with great ferocity the flood of juice gushed out with a rustling weltering sound and one that was highly gratifying to me who stood beside and watched it is delightful to see pressure applied and pressure yield so much though it was not my grape juice but herr cramps one is child enough to like to see anything squeezed and to listen to the handsome noise it makes there is a certain cruel pleasure about it one fancies that the grapes resent the insult feel pain and cry out then the liquor was tested the communal officer had an exceedingly simple and rudimentary testing tube and only one but i dare say it did its work all right the long funnel of dull glass was taken off the window sill where it lay plunged into the must and examined by the light of a yellow horn window the only one in the place and just a couple of feet square at that the ingenuous peasant whose care had brought this harvest to perfection stood by full of anxiety while his grape juice was being put to the proof his wife had come in with him to see that he got fair play and she was obviously his master for each hodful the superintendent called out the result of the test the price was mentioned and a fresh load was thrown in and subjected to the great indignity of pressing that is what it began to seem to me for the poor green globes looked so translucent so innocent so otherworldly herr cramp bought the lot he was of course far too busy to attend to me and see that i tasted the must and to tell the truth i was no longer very anxious to taste it although joseph leopold who has seen a score of vintages and who was now in an inner cell eating grapes with herr cramp senior as who should say having a drink although joseph leopold said that must is most delicious 
I could hardly believe him. The squeezed mass of grapes as it came out of the small press looked for all the world like the cheap dates that I used to buy in quarter-pound wedges with my own pocket money on my way home from school. I was consumed for that hunger for eatable odds and ends that is the weakness of flappers. That mess was brown, this mess was green. That was about all the difference. Things do not as a rule look appetising after they have been squeezed and their identity utterly destroyed, and the pearly opalescent spheres that I held in my hand seemed to bear no relation to the squatted looking mass of ill-digested food rejected by the wine press. The contents of the first tub were at once thrown into a larger tub or vat in which the juice was already beginning to ferment and looked still more unpleasant. Then the mixture of squeezed grapes and half-dried residuum were put into a larger receptacle still, a press with handles that it took at least four men to turn. This, like the tubs that now held the first juice, was connected by a pipe with the cellars below, for these immense final presses had the function of squeezing out the last drop of must. They squeezed from the dull green and drooping skins of the grapes not only the last drop of moisture, but even the very colour, so that what remained looked like nothing in the world but hard cattle cake, for which, indeed, it is not seldom used. I was taken down into the cellar and gazed without much interest, but with some awe, into the enormous barrels for the process was now carried on as it were behind closed doors the must was to remain there to ferment and mature for quite a long period putting off from its spirit all that was corruptible the next time i should see it it would be glowing and dancing into a tall glass on a white damask tablecloth poured out by an indifferent footman some cold callous creature incapable of such generous enthusiasm for the liquor that was not destined to pass down his own throat as inspired herr cramp senior that i should see that must again or some of it was literally true one of those immense barrels was the property of herr cramp now joseph leopold and i had given herr cramp an order for twenty-four dozen a barrique of this particular vintage so the possibility if not the probability is that some of the liquid that was then beginning its long sleep in that tongue will cheer and inspire our own table whenever joseph leopold shall decide that our own particular barrels that are new arrivals in our own particular cellar having only just outpassed the perils of the swift rhine and the fell and stormy sea shall be fit for the tremendous and house-shaking event that is called bottling. We do the bottling. The autumn evening shadows were beginning to settle on the green meadows, the green hills, the green vines, and to infuse into that landscape the forlorn touch of greyness, which warns loiterers to hurry, and over all the fields of this pious country sets the beads clicking at the angelus. We had to walk through two vine villages on our way to the horse ferry that was opposite Tornish Station. The names of these villages were familiar enough to me. How small and unimportant they seemed, and yet they bore names that reverberate over continents and oceans and catch the eye in every railway station in Germany. Ben, Kastler, Doctor, Piesporte, Ober Emela printed so big in the wine lists, stand for the dear little domestic assemblages of white-faced, one-storied houses, against which lean pigsties and cow-buyers, hung with squirrels and magpies in cages, the goats and geese picking their ways between the rough cobblestones, the grey-green household jugs hanging like tall hats upon the palings still bearing our last bunches of grapes we entered the little station and there i found that i was not the only grape fiend 
every other person in the waiting room of the station reminded me of the bible pictures that tried to elevate my childish mind each one was bearing his grapes of eshkol in one form of package or another there were girls rather undersized these and ill-dressed looking like little london dressmakers hacks but instead of cardboard boxes in which creations were packed they depended from their elbows all sorts of knobbly checked bundles and knotted checked handkerchiefs from which they slipped and fell onto the polished floor the current spheres of translucency of which we had thought all the day there were widows they looked like widows with baskets and cruises grape juice was running composedly out of the corners of them there were unmistakable pairs of lovers holding vine trains in their disengaged hands other unclassable passengers bore sprays of the holy plant wreathed not in their hair but done up in their umbrellas little wet dusty marbles ran about on the dusty floor and were soon trodden into circles of wet stickiness a three-cornered bundle made of an apron or a handkerchief is an ineffectual and weary envelope for such an exuberant polished entity as the grape full of stored-up spirit and sunlight presently however we all packed into our train with grapes inside and out herr kramp and his father were not with us they had slyly given us the slip at Kluserat and were staying behind to celebrate the great feast of the year in at least three inns so i have since gathered they would talk it over with every fresh wirt and probably herr kramp would buy more grapes for he is a great vine handler but this thing is sure for the next fortnight on the mosel no man woman or child will talk except in terms of the grape the talk will be gay and cheerful as the minds that inspire it for this year no south german will even entertain painful thoughts old quarrels will be made up bad debts paid off heirlooms will be bought in again and the back year of mourning forgotten in that year when the vine suffered so terribly the cattle prospered and waxed fat the year after the cruel sun murderer of the horned beasts that wandered spiritlessly about the brown fields where the grass had died and lowed and yearned for a lush pasture and whose lean nervous bodies were eaten by us en maugréant the sun gave the juice of the grape to wash down the indifferent repast the pestilential heat which drove men wild till they murdered their wives and children which maddened strike committees and filled the courts of justice which nearly forced three nations into war one week of rain that year it was patent to the world would have sent the english rioters slouching home and would have brought the tetchy and absurdly protracted negotiations of german and english courts alike to a good-humoured and speedy conclusion the sun that worked all this mischief also provided the antidote and was all the while fostering the peace-dealing grape glory be i cry with old hair cramp end of section twenty five